Thanks for listening to the Belonging House Fellowship Podcast. Here is this week's message from Chris John Otto and the House of Artisans. This is a week four in my series on Lent for the Artist. This week we're talking about the confrontation between the kingdom of God and the religious spirit. Two years ago, I gave a, a long series on the kingdom of God, and, and you might remember that I, I opened each of those teachings with a phrase, and, and it was this, Jesus Christ did not come to, stab, to establish a religion. Jesus Christ came to establish a kingdom. The greatest enemy of the kingdom, and the artist, by the way, is the religious spirit. We give this spirit a lot of names, but, you know, it really is the spirit of Antichrist. This spirit prevents artists from moving forward, either by trapping them in a mindset that they have to preach, quote the Bible, or make their subjects religious, usually subpar religious, or they have to stop being artists altogether and go do something more important. And we see this all the time. In fact, I've dried a lot of tears from people who've done both these things. And both traps lead to death in the end. It's interesting. Graham Cook was teaching one time, and it was before he moved to the United States, and he he was teaching, and he was talking about how God was calling him to leave England and move to the United States. And he said he was very concerned because the stronghold over the United States was a religious spirit. He was speaking to an American audience. So you just saw the, you looked across the room and you saw the fangs and the claws come out all over the place. It was really interesting. Everyone was wiggling in their chairs. John 9 is one of the most poignant episodes in the Gospels. The story of the man born blind. Here is a man who gains everything and loses everything in the same moment. John uses blindness and darkness as a metaphor for the religious authority of the Jews as a contrast to Jesus being the light of the world. And these two contrasts come to their head in this chapter. Actually, this is one of those points in the story where the plot advances and the conflict increases. This story actually begins in the previous chapter. It's Sukkot, so we're six months before the cross. Half of John's gospel takes place in this time frame, from the time, from the six months before Jesus' death and resurrection to the end of his life on earth. A third of the Gospel of John takes place in the last three days of Jesus' earthly life. And Jesus is in danger. They're trying to kill him. It's so dangerous. And it's, it reminds us of a lot of these stories we hear in the news in the Middle East, you know, of people who are leaders and they're in real danger, you know, political leaders, and they have to hide and they're being protected. That's what's going on here. Tensions are high. And he had to go into Jerusalem in secret. So he sent the disciples off ahead. And he didn't even tell them he was coming. And I'm sure he was trying to protect them as well as himself. In the previous chapter, Jesus is challenged repeatedly with one religious question after another. And at the end, that chapter, the end of chapter 8, Jesus narrowly escapes being stoned to death And what's fascinating is that he walks into the crowd that's about to stone him. And this happens in another place. It happens in Luke's gospel where they're going to throw Jesus off a cliff. And Jesus walks right into the crowd. And that's how he eludes them. It's kind of fascinating. Interesting strategy. I wonder if he disappeared or something. But he walked right into the crowd. And he walks out of the temple with the disciples, with the crowd behind them. And as they're leaving the temple, there's a man sitting by 
the gate, and that gate is still there, actually, and I've walked through it, and there are lots of beggars around, and there's a man begging, and he's blind. And this chapter begins with the disciples asking Jesus a religious question, too. He's not challenging them, but this question follows the pattern of thought in the previous chapter. And what's really interesting is that the disciples' religious question about the man has no concern or compassion for him. They just walk on by. And whenever you're dealing with the religious spirit, there will be no concern or compassion for others. So whose fault is it, his, him or his parents? They've seen blind men healed before, but they have come under the religious mindset. And so they ask a question that sounds really good. Religious questions always sound good. But they're usually not loving or compassionate. They're always about abstract ideas apart from a relationship with God and a love for people. And Jesus says to them, it's nobody's fault. No one sinned. He is blind to reveal the glory of God and to answer your question. Now, there are people out there who will take that little phrase, and they've built whole theologies out of it, saying that God makes people sick for his glory. That's not what Jesus is saying, and it is not the witness of the Gospels. What Jesus is saying is that this man was blind so that God could manifest his works through him. This blindness is going to help people see. And here it is in the Gospels now. We are in the realm of real mystery here. And then Jesus does about the most non-religious thing a person could ever do. And to be honest, it's the grossest of all of his healings. And I wince every time I read it. Gee, because it's just, I don't like to get my hands dirty. He spits on the ground into the dirt and he makes clay. That's what the Greek says. And he puts the clay on the eyes of the blind man. Jesus is demonstrating one of the core principles of the kingdom. God uses physical things to communicate his person, presence, and power. This is the sacramental principle, by the way. Jesus is turning mud and spit into a sacrament. He's doing it to mess with religious thinking. You know, it's really interesting because this principle applies to artists because we work in physical things. And the Holy Spirit can work through us. Jesus is turning mud and spit into a vehicle of his presence. He's doing it to mess with the religious thinking. Really. I, I mentioned a few months ago, I think, how God uses a fence as a tool. Jesus is using mud and this blind man to offend. He's purposely offending these people who just tried to kill him. Offense is usually the way God sorts people out. He, you know, God doesn't judge people. He lets the sheep and the goats separate themselves. It's really interesting. And then he tells him, go wash in the pool called Scent. This is actually the pool that all the pilgrims went to, to, to begin their ascent into the temple. So it was a major stop on the pilgrimage feasts. So he was going to a place that was very busy. And he tells him, go and wash in this pool. I'm sending you to get healed because you have been sent to see the light. And the man who was blind washes and he sees. And what is his testimony? A man I do not know spit on the ground and made mud and put it on my eyes. I was blind, 
but now I see. There's a testimony. Jesus is being intentionally offensive. The man is not a sinner. Jesus didn't say, your sins are forgiven. And he didn't say on the edge of the temple, go show yourself to the priest. No. He said, go wash in front of the pilgrims and be healed. And to really mess with their heads, he does it on the Sabbath. One of the interesting things, I didn't think about this, but you know, the reality is here, and we'll come to this later, is that they keep accusing Jesus of working on the Sabbath. But you know, the reality is Jesus is doing this from a place of rest. And because they think he's working on the Sabbath, the Pharisees curse this man. They curse the blind man. They curse his parents. His parents disown him. And he is cast out of the synagogue. And for those of you who are used to changing churches, this is a really big deal. If you're Jewish, they're saying you're not Jewish. And he has no one. And Jesus, hearing this, searches him out. The man gains his sight and eternal life. And this is the key principle of the kingdom, the, the law of the universe. In dying to everything, you gain eternal life. Jesus is the light of the world. He says this four times in the Gospel of John. And if you follow this stream of light and darkness in John, it's one of these sub-motifs. The story is a confrontation between dark and light. And that comes to a climax in John 18, where Jesus tells them on this night, darkness reigns. Who reigned that night? turns out the, the darkness was religious. It was the good guys, it turns out, that were evil in the end. What's interesting is they became friends with the pagans in order to do their business. So I said in the beginning, the greatest enemy of the kingdom and the artist is the religious spirit. So let's talk about the main characteristics of the religious spirit. And I'm going to tell you there'll be freedom in the house today. You're all going to get freed if you want to be before we're done today. So let's start with number one. The religious spirit begins from a place of self-righteousness. The Pharisees tell Jesus that they are the ones who see and he does not. The only people in this chapter who get told they're sinners even though we're hearing this word thrown around a lot, there's only one group of people who get accused of being sinners and are told their sins won't be for forgiven. And these people are the Pharisees. And because they believe they are righteous, Jesus tells them their sin remains. The first earmark of the religious spirit is rightness. Not righteousness, rightness. Religiousness begins with the assurance that whatever you believe is right, and everything else must be judged against it. Your denomination, your tradition, your doctrine, your politics, or whatever. And from working in churches, there are a lot of whatevers. Your thing is the right one, and everybody else has to correct and get in line with your thing. And you hang out with people who agree with you. There's a word for this. It's called pride. Pride makes you blind. Pride makes you blind. You won't get healed. You won't change if you're proud. And religious pride makes you double blind. Because you become blind to God and you become blind to people. And you are completely unable to see your error. And because you're always right, you are unable to humble yourself. See what is wrong and turn to God. 
And because you think you can see, your sin remains. To quote Jesus. Two, the religious spirit operates in fear and misrepresents God. And some of this is right there in the garden. You know, I'm going to share these things. and You're going to be like, this is what the serpent said to Adam and Eve. So the man's parents disowned him because they were afraid. Fear is about punishment. This is Paul. And it is essentially an orphan spirit. You're afraid. You have to take care of yourself. You have to meet your own needs. You are always expecting to get spanked. What should have been the happiest day in this family has become a tragedy. This fear is the expression of how this spirit twists God into an angry, untrustworthy, distant, angry abuser rather than a compassionate, loving, kind, and relational father. Our father is the kindest person in the universe. And if you think bad things about God, you're probably under the influence of this spirit. And I meet lots of people, and, you know, sadly, our brothers and sisters, there are people who, who further this because it's a great way to make people do things. You know, this, this idea that the Father is angry on a throne, but Jesus stands between you and him, and God looks through Jesus like a glass, and he sees you, and you're okay because of that. But the minute Jesus steps, or you step, away from the glass, God can see you the way you really are, and blammo. It's very common teaching. It's false teaching. It's not the New Testament. The religious spirit is obsessed with keeping rules and being obedient over having a relationship and being truly righteous. And let me tell you, just make it full stop. You know, there's nothing you can do to make you righteous. There's nothing you can do to make you righteous. Jesus makes you righteous. In you, Jesus in you, is your righteousness. There are many tragedies in this story. It's a tragic story. It's a Shakespearean. But probably the greatest tragedy of all is the source of the controversy. The Pharisees believed that if they kept the law perfectly, then the Messiah would come, and he would save them and vindicate Israel. That's why they're doing this. And the Messiah is standing right in front of them. And because he's not keeping their laws perfectly, they want to kill him. And they call the Messiah a sinner. Keeping spiritual discipline is good and life-transforming. Keeping rules and being obedient apart from the voice of God will kill you. One is a source of life, and the other is destruction. God looks at the inside, as we heard in the first lesson, not the outside. Man works from the outside in. God works from the inside out. God is always looking at the inside and judging your motives. There's, now, this will keep you up at night if you think about it too much, so don't. But, you know, so many times we do good things, but our motives are bad. We're twisted. And, you know, our Father loves us. So, you know, our desire needs to be that our motives change. But religion is outward focused and doesn't care what your motives are. Believing you always have to do something more for God and then... Then what's interesting is you do a lot for God, and then you discover you haven't done enough, and so you have to do a little bit more. And eventually you just get exhausted, and you crack up. And I see this all the time. Certainly, you know, half my friends from seminary, 
have had this happen to them at one point in their life. You fall down exhausted. You know, it can be penitential rituals, rocks in your shoes, you know, going on a pilgrimage on your knees. It can be that you do street evangelism and you rack up souls. How many sinners' prayers did you hear this week? It can be vol volunteerism to the point where you're 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 insane. In the charismatic world, it looks like voodoo with long prayers written in books that you have to go do in the right place and do the right thing and the right thing here and there to make something happen. But all of it amounts to magic. Trying to manipulate the spiritual realm with your activity. It's a distortion of what Jesus said and did. And as Jesus said, people do a lot of things in his name that appear to get short-term results, but in the end, they never knew him. It's always about relationship. So basically, the rule of thumb is if you're doing a spiritual thing without God, that's gonna that's religious, that's the religious spirit. And as we see here, the blind man didn't do anything except wash his face. And the reason he washed his face is because Jesus had caked mud into his eyes. So he was forced to wash his face. You don't have to do anything to make Jesus happy with you. Because Jesus is already happy. Really. When you fall into this trap, often there are hidden things. There's hidden sin problems. And I've, I've seen it. Nothing shocks me anymore because I've seen and heard all of it. Because uh, when you are trying to make Jesus happy because you think he's unhappy, you have to do something to make yourself feel better. And in the end, it doesn't make you feel happy. A lot of this ends up being sexual. And then someone exposes the back of the puppet stage. And you have the whole, the the, the saga the that we have all heard a thousand times of the leader that's fallen and everyone then turns against him and throws stones at him even though they created the system that put him in the situation. You know, we have to be real about this stuff. And the only antidote for this is humility, going low in honesty, going low and getting real. You know, somebody told me this week, they said they were shocked at how open I am about how I feel and things going on in my life. And I said, you don't understand, this is life and death. Yeah, no, I... Yes, I do say, tell people when I'm having a bad day. And I it's because I used to do it the old way. And it just about killed me. And, and we're back to rest. You know, I said, Jesus did this from rest. When you have a religious spirit, you can never rest. Oh, the day that I went to see the queen, lying in state, waited six hours, Along the Thames, my feet were bleeding. I got in there, had this encounter with God at the lying in state, and I come out, and a demonized man met me right at the door. He saw my collar, and he just said, You're a man of God, and the man of God can never rest, and you have to work hard, man of God. You have to work day and night. You have to work day and night. And he was screaming at me, and he was getting a little violent. Well, I did something a little out of character for me because I had just had this moment, you know, it was a really profound moment. And I got right into his face and I put my finger in his nose and I said, you back off, you religious spirit. There's a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And I said, you leave me alone. Well, he didn't leave me alone. He followed us down for blocks, screaming, the man of God can never rest. And I said, well, there's a word right there. There's a word. We need to rest. You can never rest if, you have, if you're under a religious spirit. And you can never come into the rest described in Hebrews 4. And, you know, one of the great tragedies is that Hebrews 4 is translated so badly because the people who translate it all have either don't know Jesus or are under a religious spirit. 
And so they don't know how to translate this. The only person who's ever translated it in a in a way that makes sense is Brian Simmons in the Passion Translation. There is a faith rest life that we come into when we are in Christ. And we're called as the people of God to be in Yeshua. And Yeshua is the Shabbat. He is the personification because he is the fulfillment of all things. So when we come into Jesus and we live in his presence, we come into rest. And you rest from your labors as God did because Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. And when you have a religious grid, there is nothing more befuddling and confusing than this reality. Everything you do in Jesus, you do in rest. Not work, obligation, or fear. The religious spirit calls the work of God the work of the devil. Because this spirit is directly opposed to the kingdom, it will not recognize the authority of Jesus and will try to turn the work of God around and oppose it. This is why Jesus said they accused him of he when when they accused him of healing through satanic power that this was a sin against the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus said this particular sin is unforgivable. And you know there this particular sin is a cottage industry in the United States. All you have to do is listen to Christian radio. There are many who think this is godly discernment saying that the gifts, healing and prophetic ministry are demonic in nature. And, you know, when they say these things, they feel a rush of power. Just like when Christian leaders endorse sin, they feel a rush of power, and they think that it's the Holy Spirit, because they've had a form of godliness without any power. So we have to judge things very carefully. This spirit is the most vile of all the demonic entities because it makes people think they're doing good when they're actually evil. The religious spirit attacks, labels, and accuses, and then asks questions. Remember, the enemy is called the accuser. Anytime you accuse, point the finger, or label someone, you are coming into agreement with the enemy. Anyone. This man who Jesus clearly says is not in sin is labeled a sinner by people Jesus says will not be forgiven of their sins. This is dangerous business. And it manifests in an ob ob obsession with who is in and who is out. What did they do? They kick him out because he won't line up with what they want him to say. And in the end, nobody is religious enough to make this fake God happy. The religious spirit deceives people into believing human authority is equal to, and then usually far superior to, the authority of God. That their God only works through the structures of men. The structures they've created, usually. Jesus said, judge a tree by its fruit. And where he is working, there is going to be the fruit of the Spirit and real lasting fruit in lives. In places where the religious spirit reigns, ministries are judged by outward human standards. Credentials on the wall, who your covering is, what stream you're connected to, what denomination you're in, or how much money you make, how big your congregation is. And Jesus loves to offend. And he raises up children from stones to be children of Abraham. And he's done it again and again and again throughout history. Finally, religion is obsessed with unanswerable questions and provides unquestioned answers. 
There are a lot of questions out there like the one the disciples began with. Who sinned and made this man blind? Who, who is predestined? And does God send people to hell for his glory? Why do bad things happen to good people? How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Do you realize, see, they're all in the same category. Paul tells us in many places to avoid these kinds of conversations and to avoid foolish arguments. Jesus answers the question by spitting on the ground and making mud. I think he may have been expressing his feelings. You do not have to look very hard to find places where all this behavior gets rewarded. All you do is look around briefly on the internet. So today, we want to get free from this spirit, don't you? I hope you do. So let's talk about a few practical things you can do. First, stop asking stupid questions. You know, I hope no one ever asks me again, what is Christian art? Oh, I hate that question. Can I ask a stupid question? Yes, Herman. What if I don't know what a stupid question I'm is? I'm just, oh, that, that, I'll have to edit this out. I was on a roll. No, that's good. That's good. I, we're just, I'm not going to belabor this. Don't worry. Actually, you, you always ask good questions, though. I mean, generally. The question, you know, religious artists have to paint religious subjects and they have to live religious lives. And generally in our world, where the church has no place for the artist, and in many places the church is now in disarray, that leads to bad art. God is calling you to be in the kingdom, and that means being connected to the physical realm. God wants to use the clay under your fingernails to manifest his glory, <laughs> to manifest his glory and his light. You know, we are physical people. Uh, two, lay aside your labels. That means it's more important to be in Jesus than whatever ism or whatever. You're in the kingdom. And if you're in the kingdom, that means you live in Jesus. And let me tell you, you know, sometimes people say, Chris, you don't like the church very much. You know, I love the church. I really love the church. The church breaks my heart a lot because I love the church. But, you know, I've worked, with, I've worked in every Christian denomination in them, with people, in them, in the trenches, with people. I used to live with nuns. You know, I went to an evangelical college. I traveled in an evangelical revival ministry. Uh, so those are pretty extreme. Even Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox. I've worked with Greek Orthodox. I've worked everything except for the Seventh-day Adventists. I've never worked with them or the Quakers. But pretty much everybody else. I love God's people. And, you know, wherever you go, you meet people who are in the kingdom and wherever you go, you meet people with heavy religious stuff who want to put it on you. Really? Nobody's safe in this. You need to live in Jesus. You need to be connected to him. You cannot be connected to Jesus without the Holy Spirit and Holy Communion. That's the Bible. And when you do that, you become different and your work and your life become different from the inside out. Your inner life determines your creative output. You've got to let go of performance and perfectionism. You know, I'm at the British Film Institute every day sitting there. And I'm a goer and a doer. So to just when God tells me to go do nothing, it really drives me a little nutty. And the Lord said, you know, I, I'm asking you to sit here because these people are all about performance and self-promotion. I told someone this week, you don't have to do another thing for Jesus for the rest of your life. And they thanked me. The performance trap is an epidemic in the church. And you know, there are many people who think that, that starting in the spirit 
And then ending is in the flesh is not only normal, but the preferred plan for the good Christian. And they've never read the book of Galatians. Paul tells us that if God moves his, in his spirit and then you add your effort to it, that is witchcraft. And you are bewitched. And it's interesting, it is, because it ends up being control, manipulation, and domination. You don't initiate with God. You don't so do something to get God's attention. God initiates with you. And you go and wash in the pool as a response. In heaven, there are no auditions. So many of us in the art world know that our, our work is only as good as our last audition or our last project or our last whatever. And this can lead us to perfectionism. The Pharisees were trying to be perfect to make God do something. And this is the enemy of the kingdom. God is going to do what God is going to do, and God rejoices over you. And Jesus, when he saw the man was in trouble, went and sought him out and looked after him. God is committed to you and your process. If you look at your life over a long time, hopefully you'll see growth. We all have bad days. Finally, Go low and humble yourself. Every day, you have to choose to open your heart and be teachable. Every day. Admit that you do not have all the answers. And when people ask you hard questions or difficult questions, you say, oh, I don't know. And that your work and your life is moldable. Keep it moldable in the hand of the potter most powerful thing you can say really is, Lord, I believe, I don't understand. Every day we have to come back to the Bible and open our hearts and say, teach me, Lord. So, Lord, we want to see today. If there's been something in what I've said today that resonates with you, I just want you to take a moment. We're just going to do something really simple. We're just going to say, Lord, if, if this anything in here has resonated with you, Lord, I renounce it. I renounce agreement with the religious spirit. I renounce the fake God that says I have to do things to make him happy, who's really angry and mean. And if I don't do it right, he's going to spank me. I renounce that. That's not the kingdom. It's not holy. And Lord, I renounce and, and admit that there are days when I think I'm better than other people and I'm right. And so I humble myself before you and acknowledge that I don't have all the answers. And I release that to you right now in Jesus' name. in any ways that I've thought that I have to do things perfectly or do more things to earn your favor. Lord, any ways that I've uh, come into a performance trap and in, in, in this idea that I have to do it right and I'm all obsessed with my things, I, I let go of these things and I give them to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask you for your forgiveness for any way I've come into agreement with this. And I know that it is for freedom that you have set me free, Jesus. And so I bring this to you now, and that you would put salve on my eyes and heal me so that I'll see Jesus. And I just speak over any of you who need freedom from this, and I just say in the name of Jesus, Every religious spirit has to go. You have to go now. You can't attach yourself to me or anyone else. You have to go to Jesus. And if you feel things moving or shaking, just take a deep breath and blow it out. We resist the devil. He must flee. We want you to be free today. You can't come on me. You have to go to Jesus. 
Would we ask for your angels to kind of help the process? Come, Holy Spirit, just fill us with the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that your light would flow through us. Praise you, Lord. Lord, we ask you to seal this, Lord Jesus. We thank you that it is the spirit of adoption, spirit of life in Christ Jesus that sets us free from the law of sin and death. So we just release that now in Jesus' name, the life in Christ Jesus. Mm, thank you, Father. Just go ahead and put your hand on your heart. We ask you, Lord, to go on it deep and just heal where all this is left and fill everyone with your presence, with your spirit. Restore the sense of being. Mm. Some of you have places in your soul that have been split because of this. You're trying to do two things at the same time. And I just say, uh, we, we pull that double-mindedness together. It should only be pointed in one direction. Lord, we ask you to seal all this today, this teaching. Lord, if there's more that needs to be done in everybody's life, we just ask you to, to uh, do it great with your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for freedom. Thanks for listening. If these messages have helped you, please like, subscribe, support, and share. You can find out more about Belonging House Fellowship in the description. No matter what's happening in your life, remember, fear not, God can be trusted.